Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Evaluating Risk in Your Device Supply Chain. My name is Melissa Russell, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Um, before we get started with our presentation, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. Uh, the first is this webinar is being recorded, and afterwards we will be sending out a link to the recording as well as a PDF link to the slides. Um, I also wanted to bring up the Q&A. So anytime you do have a question, please feel free to go ahead and put it into the Q&A. We will probably take most of those questions towards the end. Um, so we will save a little bit of time towards that. Um, at this time, I do want to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. I am joined by Paul Azadorian, who is our Principal Security Evangelist here at Eclipsium, and also with our Senior Vice President of Strategy, John McCadies. So gentlemen, welcome. And at this point, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Paul. Thanks, Melissa. It's good to be here. John, welcome. Thank you. Always fun. <laughs> Always. I mean, I like my name's Paul and I love talking about firmware and supply chain security. Yeah, especially talking about it with John Lucades. <laughs> yeah, my name is John and I have an addiction to talking about, about uh, firmware security. <laughs> so, I mean, let's jump right into it. Um, and, and perhaps maybe lay out an agenda uh, first before we dig into the, the first slide. John, I think primarily we're going to focus on some supply chain problems, uh, threats, uh, and real-world attacks in firmware, and then take the rest of the agenda. Yeah, so we, we, we sort of start off by talking through um, sort of what supply chain attacks, how you can sort of break them up into different pieces, and that's, that's where we're going to get on this slide. Um, as we go, we're going to talk about some examples. We're going to talk about how those examples have caught on with regulations and other parts of uh, the industry. And then we're going to sort of conclude with what you can do about it, how you can sort of handle these, these different types of problems that have different types of solutions. Sound good? I came up with this new analogy. It sounds great, John. And I came up with this new analogy, and I think it's relevant to this slide. Um, and I got thinking about Star Wars, and I'll give everyone kind of a sneak peek as to what I'm thinking. And if you're familiar with Star Wars, um, you may remember Order 66, right? There was literally a chip inside of the clone troopers that triggered them to change their behavior, unbeknownst to the Jedi Order. I was like, wow, that was an interesting supply chain attack that is a major plot point in, in the Star Wars canon. And then I got thinking about the thermal exhaust port, which is an interesting supply chain. We can have analogies actually right on this slide, right? Because it was a vulnerability. However, it was a vulnerability put there on purpose by Galen Erso that we find out in, in Rogue One. I don't think we knew that in A New Hope necessarily. I think we knew that they had discovered some vulnerability. We didn't know that it was put there on purpose until, uh, until Rogue One, at least in the film uh, canon. So then yeah, I have one... I have one more, but oh, if you good. haven't watched Andor, I don't want to spoil it for you. So my last one comes from Andor. So your homework is to go watch that if you have. Nice. Yeah, because, you know, um, I did see some stuff before Rogue One came out where people were complaining about, um, I think there was one, uh, you know, OSHA would not be uh, happy with the second Death Star and these reactor shafts that you can just fall down and all mm -hmm. that. Right. Or uh, it, or the, the exhaust port and like, OK, seriously, you built this whole Death Star and you left this thing. So it actually was a was a nice plot point in Rogue One where it's like, no, nah, that was not an accident. Um, right. And so yeah, and I, I talk about that when, you know, if we look at all the components that that make up your computer and I like to think of the vulnerability supply chain problem as just one. Right. I mean, we mentioned we're going to try and cover some of the different aspects of supply chain issues, as it were. And I think vulnerability is one. And it's interesting to think about, was it there unintended or was it planted there yeah. in, on purpose? Exactly. Um, obviously, the more common one is the log for j is the open SSL. There are vulnerabilities in software. Uh, Lenovo just had ones that they've recently fixed, right? Those weren't put there on purpose. Um, it was an unintended vulnerability, but it's still a vulnerability in a supply chain uh, sense that it's an area that you don't control. So let's like run this back through your uh, 
your Star Wars analogy, right? And if you're trying to detect the sort of problems that you describe, you're going to try and detect the extra little chip that went in uh, the clones for Order 66. You got the same sort of problem as what the um, uh, the Bloomberg Supermicro, you know, you know, article was all about. And you have to actually go pretty deep to go find those things because they're so buried in between so much other stuff. You're never you're never going to see it on the surface. Right? You got to go deeper. Same thing with your exhaust port, right? Right. Of of all the things in the Death Star, right? There's this there's this exhaust port, and oh by the way, it's a cascading of failure. When this fails, then this fails, and this oh by the whole thing blows up. Whoa, you know that that sort of dependency problem fits perfectly the kind of thing that we're talking about with the supply chain here. Yeah, and if this is you know in relation to your PCs, servers, and laptops that's prob it's a dependency problem like how much time does an it team have to go trace down all of the what in software we call transient dependencies uh, to a certain extent but also tracing down the supply chain you know as we depict here on this slide you've got your oem that puts together multiple pieces of hardware and software each with their own independent supply chain right and and what does um uh, another interesting thing about your analogy, especially with the Death Star, is we're talking about these things that are dependent upon in a critical way, right? In a way that the whole rest of the system is going to come crashing down um, or exploding, I guess. But uh, the the funny part is that that is a good relation uh, relationship or way of describing firmware, right? you're building on top of firmware. You always are building on top of firmware. That's why it exists. And if something goes wrong, it has the ability, it, it, it is at that foundational level where the other stuff will come crashing down too. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think also, you know, preserving and looking at your supply chain when you are purchasing stuff is something that I had not considered as much as I did when I started working here at Eclipsium. And, you know, I use my framework laptop as an example. Like I wanted to buy a framework laptop because they're nerdy and they're cool. And I buy lots of PCs and servers and laptops because I'm a nerd. And I was like, oh, I really want the framework. And then I was like, wait, how, where does the BIOS come from? And, you know, it turns out like in frameworks case, they're acting as the OEM. So it's an Intel based laptop. And I was like, okay, how are they dealing with Intel ME, which is one of the components we'll talk about uh, perhaps a little more later on. And I'm like, oh, they're dealing with it in this way. They're disabling it in this way. So that that's good. And then I'm like, well, where do they get the BIOS from? I'm like, oh, that comes from inside. But they licensed it from inside. So they've got some control themselves. The OEM has some control. They're still going to have to fix any downstream which they've already had to do actually downstream vulnerabilities that came uh, from inside and produce a, a firmware update for their users. But the problem is depicted on the slide, as, as you and I both know, John, is all those different components, right? Those are just two different components that I mentioned, right? You've got your uh, uh, storage controllers, you've got memory controllers, you've got uh, all sorts of different components and subsystems that, again, each have their own supply chain that you have to take into account. That might be where we want to sort of look at this, this idea of the iceberg mm -hmm. um, and point out that we're not the only ones who have made this observation, right? This isn't really earth shattering new rocket science that we haven't that, that, that took us a lot of work to figure out. Um, we've kind of known this all along, but what you're starting to see is, is that more and more organizations are recognizing it. And in this case, um, DHS CISA, part of the US government, handling things like uh, infrastructure security, cybersecurity, um, they specifically looked at this problem of there being this, this sort of surface, we actually use the same concept in our below the surface uh, monthly threat report, um, where you've got 
some stuff going on above you know the iceberg that you can see this is what you're interacting with as part of your device and you you're going to support and you're going to configure and handle the operating system applications maybe network but below all of that and depending on all of that or all of that depends upon uh things like uefi code to start up the machine well it turns out it doesn't go away it also has a runtime part to it uh, firmware that's part of each of your devices peripherals storage um, you know network adapters um, any of these uh, things that you use and you don't really have to you don't think that you have to configure you don't think you have to maintain they just work yeah that's probably because it's a pile of code that we call firmware that makes it work it's interesting um I wanted to chat with you about S bomb briefly on this slide, John, and some of my thoughts where um, I don't, the analogy comparing it to an ingredient label, uh, I think helps at a high level that the analogy starts to fall down after the high level, in my opinion. But the, the thing that gets me is that if you've ever read an ingredient label and you've read like the last line that says like other spices and herbs, and you're like, wait, like what? What is that? What do you mean? It's not explicitly called out. And I think that gets me thinking about like basically two different S-bombs and who I trust. So if the supplier provides an S-bomb, I'm like, yeah, okay, that's 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 nice, but like I don't trust you, right? Because that I've been thinking about the supply chain and I'm like, well, why should I trust you? I need to, in order to have trust, there needs to be some validation. And that's where I think the the S bomb that you could generate on your own once you receive that thing from that supplier should be also used um, and generated and then do a comparison, right? Because I think S bombs yeah. are great, but it's how you use them. Uh, and I think that I put much less trust in the one that comes from the supplier. I put more trust in the one that I generate that's actually looking at what's running in, in my environment. But I think our product has some examples of validating what you have on your systems and not necessarily trusting that what it says it's running is really what's running on the system. And I think S bombs should be treated in the same light. I, I think you're right. And, and I think uh, that's, that's sort of going to come up again later as we talk about what we did with NIST. Mm -hmm. And um, there's this different uh, ecosystem where we are all interdependent across the industry, right? You've got software folks that are dependent on an operating system and how that operating system does stuff. It could be Windows, it could be Linux, Apple, whatever. Um, you can look at the operating system and they're dependent on how the hardware operates too, right? So you got your Intel and AMD and all these different ARM-based systems. Um, e any one of those layers can break the one above it, right? And just like when you know that you're buying a certain thing and you're buying it for a reason, what's the, um, uh, you know, just having that information uh, um, at handy, mm -hmm. that's one thing, but what are you going to do with it? Right. And right. It, you're going to, you're going to end up finding that there's a lot of stuff available underneath the surface that nobody's looking at. And sometimes that's cool because it just works but other times it's stuff that if you were to look at it like maybe a security property or you know an attestation or something like that it's there you could use it but no one uses it and so as a result these things that you could actually defend against um nobody does and i think that's kind of where you're gonna gonna go on this on this yeah. slide you know looking at the history here and it turns out, you know, attackers have looked at this particular attack surface, right, that I think to this point we've established as multiple supply chains that make up devices that belong to your organization. And one of the common questions that we we often get is, well, what are the real world attacks against these things that are below the surface, right, that are specifically firmware that have these supply chain issues in, in a big way? And so I put together this this timeline. Um, I had a lot of resources at my disposal, including John and some of your previous research uh, that we used to put this together. And other than Mibromi in 2011, 
the remainder of these threats um, that are malware tied in most cases tied to some threat actor group are taking advantage of UEFI vulnerabilities on the system. So um, it was an interesting exercise to look at the evolution. Um, you know, it started in in BIOS. And I put Mabromi on there because it was it was very UEFI like, even though it was BIOS, it was attacking like the BIOS code, whereas like previous to 2011, it was very much like a master boot record. So they were more just putting stuff on the disk in the master boot record uh, was the common attack. Mabromi was interesting because they attacked the actual BIOS code. Um, and that 2011 is an interesting time point because UEFI was being developed and defined leading up to 2011. And 2011 is where we started seeing adoption uh, of UEFI in the market. So when you bought a computer, that's when it started to come with UEFI and not, uh, and not BIOS. And then of course, hacking team, in the hacking team leak was the Pandora's box, in, in my opinion, uh, that kind of opened up the floodgates after the hacking team leak. And there was source code on GitHub that you could use to attack UEFI. We started to see an evolution, right? We started to see that in different threat actors, uh, kits and, and toolkits, uh, all the way, I, I think, culminating with Cosmic Strand where if you want a really good example with a really great graphic of how an attacker would hook all of these different processes and sequences as your computer starts up to maintain persistence, to do it stealthily and have a great impact on the system, that to me, that was the one where it kind of all came together. Black Lotus is kind of an interesting one. That was an exploit kit that was found on an exploit uh, marketplace, I should say, it wasn't necessarily the dark web, right? An exploit marketplace um, that has not yet been confirmed. It got some press, um, but it has not really been confirmed to my knowledge. Did you, uh, what, what are the things that I find fun about this is sort of uh, looking at how this parallels other um, security research or, or areas of exploitation, right? Um, I, I sort of look at the um, original Mabromi attack as interesting in context, uh, just to look at back to some of the NIST publications around that same time. NIST was uh, pushing signed BIOS updates because mm -hmm. if you, you know, around this time or really more before this time, um, if you don't sign the BIOS update, that means I can write anything I want and you're gonna put it on the, in the BIOS, that's cool. Um, so these update mechanisms that would allow you to uh, change the code uh, were a known attack vector long before this. Mm -hmm. uh, funny, funny sort of connection, what Membromi was doing was actually leveraging that update interface. And it was, uh, there were some aspects of it that were secured, but on these particular platforms, um, there was a way to just rewrite portions and it used that. The fun bit is that that sort of comes up again after UEFI sort of takes over and there are these standard mechanisms. You start looking at the capsule update part of UEFI to sort of standardize how the signature check is supposed to work. But a lot of, a lot of things just mirror before and after. And so, before there was a way with BIOS that this could be done in a secure fashion and you, you needed to have locked down all of these parts of the platform. If you didn't do that, then it, it was the signature check was bypassable. And if you look at NIST 800-147, that's the spec for all this sort of signed BIOS stuff. And in there buried in, in some of the paragraphs explains that you actually need a mechanism to lock in what's there so that it can't be updated outside of this interface. Right. Well, the implication is this vulnerability that then gets exploited in uh, Lojax. There's that under 2018 there mm -hmm. um, where they, they exploit this vulnerability and are able to change the code. And, you know, you sort of see this initial, the first thing I'm going to do is persist idea. The first thing everybody thinks of, right. Um, and then you start seeing that reuse happening that, that you were talking about with hacking team. It's sort of an inflection point. Um, 
all the way down to uh, this Black Lotus item. For me, it sort of parallels, again, you got the whole script kitty concept. At some point, the code's there. Anybody can go grab it and do anything they want to it. And that matures into an exploit marketplace, which is exactly what we're seeing, right? Yeah. And the price tag on the Black Lotus um, exploit kit was five thousand dollars. So now it becomes one? more. It becomes more accessible. Should get you one for your birthday. That's right. <laughs> All I want for Christmas is an exploit kit. Yeah. So kind of coming back to this, this government um, sort of taking a, 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 a an interest in these problems. You're starting to see, and and it, okay, it's not surprising, right? We've seen a number of attacks, and shockingly, the government kind of catches up by releasing a number of uh, um, official documents. But we've got everything from the presidential executive order mm -hmm. down through the Office of Management and Budget, actually, yeah, sort of specifically saying you need to go do these things to all of the you know civilian agencies. Um, down to the Department of Commerce, you know, doing an analysis of supply chain. And of course, all of this is in context of the last few years where supply chains can mean a lot of things and yes. all of them have problems. Um, in, in, you know, the Department of Commerce specifically out of all of that pulls out firmware and says, this firmware supply chain is, this, is a major risk that really needs work, right? And you can sort of walk this through each of the different places where you know government or any regulatory body sort of walks walks through their requirements. Um, can we can we move on to the next slide? And I'll just sort of walk through these. This is this is a build, so you can sort of look at uh, NIST eight hundred fifty three, uh, the cybersecurity framework, uh, private sector controls like PCI DSS and CIS. Um, the interesting observation as you walk through these things and you do it like historically, you look at what's changed. Um, in the beginning, it's my opinion that everybody had the idea, let's write this very generically so that it, it, it includes all of these different things. Um, when I kind of write requirements, I tend to do that because I don't want, uh, I don't want to limit to to too much, right? I know that there's a bunch of stuff out there. There might be a lot of ways to do something. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you notice that over time, they've started to explicitly add language that says, and firmware, or software, firmware, and hardware, right? And that's a recognition, I think, of what gets forgotten when you don't do that. And interestingly, my, my look at things like firmware, they exist so that you can just use something and you don't have to worry about all of those details. This is like a layer of abstraction. Yeah, because I think it, it is different from hardware and separate from some of the other software that we think about in those different supply chains. But firmware really is just software that's inconvenient to program. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. That's about right. And good that the standards are now calling it out because I think it is, it's treated somewhat differently. I think you have less control over firmware than you do over lots of other software. software I like to make this someone else's problem. Well, <laughs> but I think so. I, my, oftentimes I think software is more accessible and easier to address some of the issues. So I have more control over the, if I'm writing software, I am incorporating libraries in my software. I could change those libraries out. I can update them. I could write it myself. Uh, and I've done, I think all of that in, in software projects that I've worked on, right? So it's not, sure. if I can do it, it's not that hard. Um, it, it's certainly easier, I think, than when, as I described the, the OEMs paint you in a corner, uh, with firmware and hardware, and you're just kind of stuck with whatever they give you, and you're waiting on them, and maybe they're waiting on someone else further in, in the supply chain to produce a fix. Um, I know one of the interesting things 
uh, with Intel, and I, I totally think they're going to fix this problem because they have new graphics cards, and it like made all the news this week that you needed <laughs> Intel ME in order to update the firmware in your Intel Arc graphics card. And I'm like, no need to freak out. Like Intel's going to fix this. Like there's probably the like an easy path for them to update firmware now as they become more available in the market. I'm confident my prediction is that there will be uh, a, a, a way to update them, even if you're not using an Intel ME uh, process or a processor with Intel ME. Yeah. If you go on to the next slide, I think you kind of get into how this connects with what the um, what what the requirements that are kind of coming out of OMB are all, all about. Uh, look at this idea of self-attestation and artifacts about how you're securing software and then connect that to what you just said, Paul, about uh, firmware is software that's just harder to program, right? And in many ways that really works, right? That you have the same problems, you have the same capabilities. You wanna swap out libraries, sure you can. It's just harder to do it in yes. firmware. And so in a way that's, that's interesting to me because what that means is whenever something's harder, it's a disincentive. It acts as a, as a way for fewer people to actually do it, right? Mm -hmm. So what, we mean when we say that firmware is harder to program is that fewer people are actually going to change or update or fix all those same supply chain problems that we are reading about from OMB in this case that they want to see these attestations for. Mm -hmm. What you're going to see as an outcome and a very easy to predict outcome is you're going to find out that you have a bunch of firmware, it's all out of date, and it's a mess as far as vulnerabilities are concerned. That's normal. I, that's what that's what we see all the time at Eclipsium. Yeah, it oftentimes you're, uh, well, in some cases, you have to wait for the supplier to issue a firmware update in order to fix these even configuration problems Absolutely. just because of the the way that everything is put together, you know, it, on actual hardware, it it has this. I've asked this question of John in our research team. I'm like, why can't I just go change that configuration? And they're like, no, 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 no. Like you, you have to. All the components aren't there to even read that configuration change. So like, you have to wait for a firmware update. I'm like, well, like that's interesting because like in like I said in software, like I can just go change a bunch of stuff and then fix all my stuff and make it all work together. Like I sometimes I physically can't do that when it comes to firmware and hardware, which I even I if think you know exactly important. what to do, right? Yeah, I'm like I, I mean, like I know what to do. Like hey, I, I know what to do. I know what to, I can fix. Like no, can't do that. No, well you could, right. but it may not fix the problem, or you might break your system. So well, there's that. There's that. There's that. And if you go to the next slide, you will see we're not making this up, right? This isn't just unique to you and me, right? 88% um, of organizations have been a victim of firmware level attack. What does that mean, right? Unpack that a little bit. Look at what the firmware level attacks are. It's hardware that's harder, oh, sorry, it's, it's software that's harder to program, right? Well, okay, my network, equipment, this this router that is buried somewhere in a closet, only a couple of people know how to mess with it. So they mostly set it and forget it, right? And that's good because no one wants to be messing with this all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Except that that thing is probably running really old software. That software is composed of vulnerable libraries or vulnerable subcomponents and now exploits that work on those old known vulnerabilities are gonna work on that critical piece of equipment that is so critical that you don't wanna touch it. Mm -hmm. So this is a disconnect. This is, a, this is the sort of thing that makes security interesting to me, at least, at least to me, because it, it, it doesn't, uh, that the disconnect between what actually is critical and needs to be secured versus what's going to happen when you actually deploy it is what makes it a security problem. And, and at least I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's security risk versus operational risk. And 
I think in most cases, there is a higher operational risk when you propose, yeah. hey, I want to update the firmware on all of our routers and switches. Yeah. Think about that. That's an that's an exercise. Many of us, you know, many listening have probably been part of that project or had to do that. That's not taken lightly, I think. What acceptable failure rate do you have when you do that? It's like zero. <laughs> like zero? <laughs> yes. Yeah, especially with the physical supply chain being under stress. If I do, let's say, break a system, now I have to get a replacement. Well, that that could be challenging. Exactly. So now you you see why this is an interesting problem, right? You're kind of in a corner. If you go and update all this stuff, you might be incurring a lot of operational risk. If you don't, you might be incurring a lot of security vulnerability risk. And, and security yep. risk, right? Shockingly, 88% have problems with this. Right. <laughs> and most people choose huh. the security risk over the operational risk, right? Yeah. The, the, the operational is the self-inflicted wound the, that we try to avoid because it it could mean business downtime, right? And yeah. that's uh, when you evaluate the business risk, it's like, well, we should just wait. I mean, nothing yeah. bad is happening on this firmware is what people will claim. But how do you know unless you're looking? is always what I follow that up with. So. Well, so, so how do you get out of that, right? And, and so that's, I think, what we're going to end up talking about here is, all right, I'm, I'm hosed, right? Like you told me that no matter what I do, I'm, I'm in trouble. Well, actually, there are some things you can do. Mm -hmm. And I think if we keep digging, we're going to we're going to sort of get to that. You, you right now, we're, we're sort of making the point that we're not the only ones seeing this problem. Uh, one of the other examples of that is looking at what all of these government agencies are seeing themselves when they look at what gets exploited. Um, I always love to uh, give credit to CISA for actually maintaining a list of known exploited vulnerabilities. That's really cool. And I also appreciate the fact that you pronounce it correctly. <laughs> oh, what, 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 what other option was there? So many people say CISA. I'm like, no, it's CISA. Like, uh, yeah. Someone yeah, from it's... CISA was like, no, Paul, it's CISA. I'm like, okay, I won't make that mistake ever again. Nice. Okay. <laughs> well, now I know. Now you know. I did it right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the thing is that all these government agencies have this view on what's going on that's a little different than most of us. And it's useful for them to be able to point to stuff and say, okay, of all the stuff that everybody's looking at and seeing, and, and let's be honest, there's a myriad of CVEs out there. And there's always another myriad being you know, released that people are learning about. Okay, I can't deal with all that. What am I going to deal with? Well, if you really cut it down to like what's being attacked right now, they're maintaining a list of that. And of that list, a whole bunch of these are in firmware. Now, what does that mean? It means it's harder to program. I really like your definition, Paul. Yes, <laughs> it's a good one. Um, and, and I like the, the CISA KEV, uh, the known exploited vulnerability list. And I, I tend to track what is being put on that list because it's worth mentioning, it's worth talking about, it's worth paying attention to if you're trying to defend uh, an enterprise. I think it helps you prioritize your remediation efforts, which remains to be the one of the, if not the most difficult thing that defenders have to do today is make decisions about, am I going to fix this over that? Am I going to fix this or am I not going to fix it, right? That's still a very challenging thing. And year over year, this has been getting worse, right? You, you, yeah, you can look at the ones on the screen, you know, 2021 routinely exploited vulnerabilities that they did as this joint advisory. Um, the uh, the CVs specifically um, being targeted by ransomware. These are these are pretty um, significant normal occurrences. They're they're things that happen a lot. If you go to the next slide, you'll you'll zoom in specifically on that KEV list. And one of the things that's really interesting is to watch how that how the different CVEs on the KEV list are breaking down among different categories. And so 
I like to sort of compare your, your uh, web browser because we all know about that. We're using one right now probably to watch this. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows because they're using it all the time that it has updates and it needs to be updated. And there's usually some way of doing that. For most of us consumers, it just automatically updates. That's great. It'll complain to you once in a while to restart it. So, okay. Um, the difference with the firmware stuff is that doesn't really happen, at least not usually. Um, when you see something prompt you for a BIOS update, you're feeling, you should feel pretty good because something is actually prompting you for that. That's good. Yes, yes. That's, that makes it doesn't always happen. Unlike yeah. everybody else, right? Also, I, I, I think, and this is a somewhat unscientific uh, based on observation. However, you could probably dig deeper. And I've, I've listened to Charlie Miller, um, who's of course, you know, famous for a lot of uh, vulnerabilities, including vulnerabilities in, in web browsers, by the way, in Pwn to Own. Um, yeah. And Maddie Stone, who is a uh, Google Project Zero. She works in Google Project Zero. I forget her exact title, um, but she works at Google Project Zero. They both uh, recently quoted as saying that software in general is harder to exploit. That today in your web browser example, for, for instance, you need to chain together more than one vulnerability to accomplish the same thing because the protections have gotten better. And in, in funny you bring up browsers, Google published a paper that was looking at uh, use after free vulnerabilities and implementing a very specific method. They did a lot of testing to prevent the zero days in Google Chrome, ironically enough, weeks later, they had more zero days in Google Chrome, but maybe they weren't use after free. Um, so, you know, <laughs> wiping out bug classes is important. Uh, where it, I think it relates to this graph, and again, this is very unscientific, I think as it gets harder to exploit applications because of all the reasons I just mentioned, and you can dig into, you know, Charlie Miller, Maddie Stone's thoughts on it as well, is that attackers are moving towards firmware, towards juicier targets that are easier to exploit that are complicated to get right. And that complication often breeds these vulnerabilities. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Every Everyone in the firmware space that I, I have talked to makes the same observation. They're looking at, and if I think about it myself, I think you're about 10 years behind on a lot of those uh, complications, countermeasures, if you will, that, uh, that something like a browser is gonna have it might even be more than 10 years, but the idea is that um, those things take a lot longer to get down the stack into firmware. And uh, that means it's gonna be easier to attack. So I, I think I think I agree with all those folks and that's a good thing because they're pretty good. <laughs> yeah, super smart people. <laughs> Otherwise I'd be in trouble. <laughs> um, so coming back to sort of what we, what we looked at with uh, some, some of these government folks, in this case, NIST, uh, the National Center for uh, National National Security Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. Wow, I'm having trouble today. Um, they do a lot of really interesting partnerships, and they they pull together industry to try and uh, solve some of these problems. Now, two of these we we really got involved in as part of sort of expanding the supply chain uh, understanding for integrity of your device and patching of your devices. And the interesting part is in both of these cases, you had something that was right in front of you that you're gonna see. But what Eclipsium does is sort of open up that, that below the surface view of all the embedded things that are in that thing. And um, in the integrity of computing devices, it's really interesting because each manufacturer puts in certain bits and pieces that they will tell you can be used to do all of these good things. Uh, maybe it's attestation primitives, maybe it's a, uh, you know, some way of doing secure boot, all that's great, um, but you actually have to use it. So who's actually looking at it is this sort of becomes the question. Yeah, and my whole thing with that is with regards to integrity is looking at the certificates, 
the hashes, keys, right? Those are like three different three different things yeah. <laughs> that fall into a class for me in the supply chain that I think is pretty unique, right? We talked about, like, I like to give the analogies, right? Star Wars aside, I like the log for J analogy of supply chain uh, issues. I like the solar winds supply chain uh, issue, right? That's a backdoor, tampering in a backdoor. Log for J is more the vulnerability side. Like what, what happens if someone loses a key or the a certificate or like we you know didn't have with Intel's boot guard, but the uh, observations that we were making based on articles written about source code that was leaked that had to do with boot guard that also included keys got me asking the questions like what who who's checking like if that key is leaked and how do we revoke it and how do you check to see if there is a supply chain issue with certificates, hashes, and or keys. And, and it's complicated, seen, right? That's why you have really the question. Complicated. Yes. So what's the impact if, so in, in, to back up, just since you brought up the, the Intel uh, source code leak thing, mm -hmm. um, what happened there was that some of the source code to a, a BIOS, UEFI BIOS, was leaked and people found it. Okay, cool. The next thing they did is they looked inside of it and they said, whoa, there are private keys in here. Yeah. Actually, no, they weren't private keys. They were some of their public keys. So it's actually okay. But right. the, the, the point was, if they were, whoa, why, how bad is this? And some of these were actually test keys. And so it's actually okay. But yeah. again, the answer, yeah, the answer was it's only bad this if time the key okay. went out in hardware that was actually shipped. And this time that that didn't happen. But I, right. I thought, thankfully, and I was like, well, this is a good exercise because now we get to think about what if it were. Now you have if to we think, detect it. How, how would you know? It? And how would you know? How exactly. would you know? Right. So that's what we were bringing to the table. That right there is what we were bringing to the table. Yes, these things are there. You can write some code somehow to do this. Unfortunately, that code is hard to program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you got a theme here and the same deal on patching, right? So let's say you were going to fix it. There are things there that might be unfixable and that's kind of hard, hard to deal with. But okay, even if they're not that, they are fixable. How are you going to do it? Probably some kind of patch. And so how are you right. going to do that, right? A firmware update. Fun thing about these documents, 1834 and 1831, both of them include the actual integration scripts and the architecture setup for how to do this. So these are not just like other NIST documents where you got a standard and you got like a bunch of requirements. This is a how-to guide on how to do this, how to, how to actually solve this problem at an enterprise level. Nice. So this is another way of looking at the what are we adding. So I think Paul, your example was was a great way of, of thinking about it. If you need a visual, you can imagine uh, you've got manufacturers that are producing these components, these subsystems, and they will often build in something that you can use. It might be um, you know the this this primitive for um, implementing a hardware root of trust, or maybe it's a, a mechanism by which you determine that the integrity is good of the device. Mm -hmm. And then the OEM actually uses that mechanism or that primitive to actually make that work on the system you buy. Cool, it works, who's if looking they, at it? <laughs> if they used it correctly. That's used another it, problem. Or used it at all, I mean, we've, discovered many examples and some people don't about use it at all yes easily. yeah how would you know if it was used if it was used how would you know if something went wrong and how would you know uh that you actually even bought the thing that had that capability in it versus the cheaper version that doesn't do it right like yeah all of those little pieces are uh, sort of where eclipsium puts this in front of you the end user instead of buried in firmware somewhere that you don't really know about right uh, i think manufacturing mode is probably a good example of one of the things that we're talking about because well the oem should 
close out manufacturing. Like when everything's done, they should close it out and it shouldn't be in manufacturing mode anymore because you're shipping the product, right? I mean, it was named for the process that should be followed uh, because in manufacturing mode, you can change a lot of things in the hardware and firmware, right? At a high level. Yeah. And but you should, you know, John and I are like, but we shouldn't find any systems today that are Aww. still in manufacturing mode. Like <laughs> people should know this. It's been publicized. Apple had the issue. They shipped some Intel Macs within manufacturing mode. That was, was that 2018, 2017 around then. time frame? No, right? that's 17, yeah. Yeah, we've known about this, but like, lo and behold, John yeah. and I go start probing systems and I'm like, oh, I'm like, no, that machine's totally in manufacturing mode, John. And it's, I'm kind of surprised. I'm like, wait, what? Didn't I deal with that like a yeah. while ago? <laughs> but that's the thing. And, and the problem is that you don't see it. Yeah. And if it was right in your face, yeah, you wouldn't see this. And some of these right. things have like sort of waves where somebody forgets or a bunch of people forget all yes. at once, you know. I've and had that, you know, it's it. funny. It's funny you say I've had that server for quite a while. Yeah. And until I was looking, I was like, oh, I'm like, that's server I bought. Everything it's like it works in manufacturing mode. It's not like it doesn't It works work. fine. Yeah, I would have never known had I known. Not had I known looks. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. all. <laughs> exactly. So if you if you go on, you sort of get into this 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 uh, solution space and you sort of think about, so how do you address this? And I am a big fan of the F-bomb. So obviously... We, we we want to talk about the F-bomb, right, Paul? That's right. The firmware bill of materials. And I, now I've got everyone kind of on this mantra of, oh, that means we're going to drop the F-bomb. Like, no, 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 no. It means you just jump it on the slot. You don't drop the F-bomb. Come on, guys. What were you thinking? I know. Um, you need, you need the you're firmware. You're going to need the F-bomb. Don't yes. drop it. Yes. So, so the idea is... Um, just like the software bill of materials. And this is sort of a play on words, but, 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 but it's a good one. So if you have a software bill of materials that came with your stuff, this is sort of an ideal case. This is great. It gives you a list of things to go look at. And from that, you can determine what you need to do. Did you notice how it's not actually the, the silver bullet? It's actually just something that you're gonna use to still do a bunch of work to figure out what you need to do. Correct. Okay. Other than that, that's good. That's good. It's a start. Um, maybe now it's possible for you to do those things where it was getting intractable before. Same thing for all of that hardware that's harder to program. And maybe it might be more essential because it's harder to program. That's, that's sort of my hypothesis here that I like to push uh, with this idea of the F-bomb. And don't drop it. Hold on to it. You need it because you're yes. going to use it for these things. And, and in, at Eclipsium, we, we do a, we kind of combine a lot of things that, that could be separate processes, but that means that you use the same information, the same scan that you take once, you're gonna use for an inventory, um, for an integrity check to see if uh, the security operations team needs to start a uh, investigation on something maybe, and also for uh, vulnerabilities and being able to see all right, how risky is that box? And so you kind of put these things together and you can see each individual module that's part of the firmware image um, and look at basically reputation, being able to see, does this hash match what's on everybody else's machine? Uh, you bought all, you know, maybe some model of device. Do they all have the same firmware really? Or do they just tell you it's the same version, right? And same thing on the uh, on the actually behaviors, right? What does it do? Does this thing go writing to the startup folder on a Windows partition uh, from BIOS? Well, okay, Lojax did that, right? Like that. Yeah. <laughs> like I can I can think of some bad reasons to do that. There's not a lot of good reasons. There's maybe one or two, you know. So that sort of thing is is what you can use but you need to come at it from both sides. If you were given this when you bought the machine, that'd be ideal. I don't think anybody has one of these to, you know, that hasn't been a thing for ever. Um, so you gotta kind of have to construct it and that's what Eclipsium is building. That's what Eclipsium is offering you. 
And so then you get into, you know, what is it that we do, right? We identify, verify, and fortify. So that first part is an F-bomb, right? Don't drop it. Mm -hmm. So you got this, this, uh, this idea that um, by running a scan, we are creating the inventory of what all the components are. And we're saving that. And you never know when something is going to happen that you need to look something up at the component level. And if you don't have this level of information, you can't do it. You have to go to each machine and run stuff. And these components have components, which Intel ME was one of the, I think, eye-opening realizations that software could tell me that I have Intel ME. I'm like, well, that's interesting. That also means I've got separate hardware on my system. It means I've got firmware. And that firmware, in ME's case, and not exclusive to ME, but that firmware can have different... Do they call it modules? I think I used the wrong. Is it modules? Can I, mean, have... I use different modules. You can... Okay. So like <laughs> ME can have all these different modules. So like your ME is not the same as my ME and different systems in my environment might have different modules in those ME that could be deterministic of capabilities, vulnerabilities, uh, and configuration settings that I might need to modify. If it has the modules for AMT or active management technology, well, what state is that in and how do I figure it out? And then how do I make sure it's in the state that I want in my environment for my systems? Am I using it or not? Maybe I can disable it. If I do want to use it, well, make sure it's provisioned across all of my systems and that we're actually using it because that's important. You know, that's a, that's a funny sort of observation that you, that you make there and, and you you really got into some of the management engine issues because as you'd start unpacking and, and emmy is like that as if you start unpacking more and more you start getting like wait what <laughs> you can do well you can do that too Jeez. yes um but if you look on the slide we we clearly have a screenshot of a server here and i know that because it has a baseboard management controller yeah and that whole concept this out of band management concept, um, it applies again to clients, except they don't have a baseboard management controller. They're not, you, you kind of know this when you buy a server and you're setting up the server, you're, you kind of buy right. it for that reason sometimes. Um, but you actually have the ability with AMT to do the same sort of thing on all your client boxes. And that gets really interesting because you know you've seen a bunch of vulnerabilities in Boy. BMC is before too, right? So, yes. Huh, there's some software doing the same sort of thing. Oh, okay. Which one has it? Which one's doing this thing? Which one's affected right. by that? That's, that's what we're answering with identify, right? But that sort of leads you to that next step of verify, right? And it's sort of leading questions, right? You know, you have this stuff. Has that stuff been tampered with? Remember back to that first slide. We sort of broke up the space and then and, and Paul you were you were you were making an analogy back to Star Wars right mm -hmm. um has it been tampered with right it might have been built this way is it still that way right that sort of thing is a detectable uh capability it's a it's something that says even if something went wrong and I don't know what went wrong am I going to be able to see the impact of that, that, that there was something that changed, that is a deviation. And we have this concept that, uh, that applies that not just at the whole device level, but to each of the components inside it. Yeah, and I like the, I believe this is the one where it's the bootloader has changed, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's right. if you're running secure boot, it, your bootloader should be good. I mean, like this part of the, the premise of secure boot is to signed, make sure that it's okay, signed, right? it's signed, it must be okay, right? And I, again, this is like my level Keys, of trust. Certificates. Well, yeah, my level again? of trust is, is pretty low when it comes to like these types of components. So I'm like, even if it's signed, I still don't trust it. And I want to know if it's changed, right? Because if I didn't change it, if an operating system update wasn't run on there, well, who changed my bootloader? And that is a, a critical component, obviously, uh, in the system, right? It's like that first piece of non-firmware software that runs on your system between the UEFI and the firmware and the operating system or the kernel. 
it is that piece in between. So it's a very critical piece of software. And verifying the integrity specifically of that piece is interesting. I don't you know can, that I would consider it firmware. I would consider it software, but we can a boundary there. Yeah. Have a debate about that next yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> but look at look at the look at the point, right? You've you've got this this piece of software. Whether it's hard to program or not, we can debate. But the idea is that it's this thing that very few few people have a reason to go look at, right? And now um, you have the ability to undermine all these other things if you tamper with it. So I care about what my bootloader does because the premise of a bootloader is to load the operating system, right? Like this is why it exists. So everything about the operating system can be undermined if you mess around with the bootloader. Well, that's why we signed it, right? That's why what this whole secure boot signing thing was all about. That's why all those vulnerabilities in that process matter because in the end, you get control of the operating system. And now here, end, here's where someone uh, typically points out that you don't necessarily need a bootloader. That you ah, can yes. use UEFI to boot your kernel. I get, I get that. If you I, I, I mean, I'm actually not opposed. On your own hardware, sure. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I'm not opposed to that. Um, it you know, worked that for approach. you. <laughs> it, it, well, that's the thing. It would work probably better on your servers that are fixed hardware and devices that are on there. So yeah, when you control a lot, you know, I, I actually yeah. had this conversation with a lot of folks about Secure Boot and whether or not you take control of it. Um, you can do that and you can put in your own keys and all that sort of stuff, but that just moves the problem. It, it's still a problem. Yeah. You own the problem. Now, if you want to own the problem, that's great. If you have no capacity to deal with the problem, I'm not sure that you're going to do a better job. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but that's actually where this, this next part comes in because it's trying to figure out where you're going to invest your time, your resources, your energy. And, um, that is a, an ongoing battle for all of us, right? We, we need to fortify the system. We know that we understand that there will be problems. Some of it is something you can predict and handle ahead of time. Some of it's unpredictable and you're going to be dealing with it one way or another. Um, okay, how are we going to sort of allocate resources to deal with these problems? If you don't have visibility below the surface, you are only going to be able to allocate your resources based on what you see, right? If you don't see below the surface, any every single one of these is an unplanned event. It's a uh, it's a surprise, right? Mm -hmm. We tend not to like surprises of that sort. Birthday gift, you know, when I give you your your exploit kit for Christmas, Paul, that that's. Uh, That'll be uh, that'll be a different sort of surprise. <laughs> the surprise that you give back to me with that exploit kit might be the kind that we don't right. want. Right. And that's what we let get to do by actually seeing the vulnerabilities, the updates, um, and being able to sort of plan when I decide to, you know, shut down my machine and install a firmware update. Mm -hmm. So that's Eclipsium, right? We uh, identify, verify, and fortify the stuff that's hard to program. <laughs> the stuff below the surface that's hard go. to program that has, any, like, the more I unpack it, an increasingly complex supply chain in, in each of those devices. So make sure that your Death Star doesn't have one of those uh, exhaust ports. Right? That's right. Make sure that, you know, when, um, oh, what was the other one? Make sure your coworkers haven't been implanted with chips. Chips in your brains. <laughs> chips yeah. in your brains. Let's make sure that 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 the brain doesn't, you know, it's it's verified to like actually be a regular brain, you know, no chip in the brain. That'd be good. That's it. That sort of thing. Awesome. Uh, we got maybe a minute or two for questions. If people have questions, feel free to put them in the the Q and A section. If we, we get do questions about chips and brains, that would be <laughs> that would be interesting. I'd have to Google that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, John and Paul. So why don't we just take one of the questions? I realize we are bumping right up against the hour, but why can't we rely on the OEM to deliver components and firmware that is already configured properly and free of perhaps known vulnerabilities? That's a problem. Yeah, 
it, but and this is one of the more common questions that we get, right? And you know, the answer, one of the answers is because it's very complex, right? To get all of these things configured correctly is a complex process. And Chen, you have other reasons why it doesn't. You've worked very closely in this space. Yeah, and and from my perspective, there's a couple of ways to look at that that problem. One is it's complicated, right? There's a lot to go wrong. There's a lot to get right. And you do need to verify it. So you can do a trust but verify approach, right? Yeah, it's not that I don't trust my manufacturer. In fact, they probably did put a bunch of stuff there. Am I looking at it is part of the pro problem there. But the other part of the problem is, do you really want to put all of your trust in one place? Well, one of the things that we're advocating here in, in you know, uh, conversations like this one, um, we are looking for a way to create zero trust in the supply chain. And the way that you do zero trust is to sort of measure risk and to confine what you do with that risky thing or what it's allowed to do um, with some sort of, it could be micro segmentation and it could be you know, access controls um, based on you know, risk levels, but it's putting you back in the driver's seat where you get to actually make decisions based on what is happening, whether it's behavior or user, or which device you're on. So coming back and sort of putting it together, think about the device that you know that you can rewrite the BIOS on this device. You know that it's an ancient BIOS and it's totally full of, full of CVEs. Is that the device you want your administrator using? Like that's the sort of question that we can answer, you know? Great. Got another one came in and we'll take this one. Um, does this integrate with existing RMM or standalone client installer? So the way that Eclipsium works, um, we give you a standalone client installer. You can run it once as a sort of single one-time scan, or you can install it and leave it running in the background and it'll just keep building up a history. We use that history and you're going to like that history yeah. Um, if something goes wrong, right? Um, but you know, you're in control of exactly when and how it runs and how much uh, time it's going to take and that sort of thing. And we we have a lot of configurability on that. We do also have a agentless capability, but that's mostly used for things like routers and switches when you you can't run on them. So what we do is we attach to their API and pull stuff back. So those things are, are kind of the way that we operate. Interesting thing you brought up, uh, RMM. Uh, there is a way to take what we have and deploy it over other systems. For example, you have an existing configuration management system. You're usually able to just include our installer into that or as a one-time scan into some script. Um, and that usually is, is fairly trivial to do. Um, over things like a BMC out of band man management interface, um, same idea, but you may have to package it into something that works with your particular tool set. But the capability is usually easy to package. Great. Well, we have gone a few minutes over time, so I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I definitely wanted to thank both Paul and John again for this amazing content and thank our audience again for taking the time out of your day to join us here. So if there were additional questions that we didn't get to, we will make sure to follow up afterwards. And like I said, we will also be sharing out the link to the recording as well as the slides. So everyone, thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Take care.